Hey traders, this is T Bradley 90 from the My Investing Club chat. As a special gift to every viewer on YouTube, there is a link in the description to apply for a free breakthrough trading strategy session with myself. What does that mean? Alex created a free trading course for beginners and at the end of it, we will be selecting a few non-members to get on the phone with myself, Tosh, T Bradley 90 to help with your trading. Click the link in the bio, watch the video and apply today. Now, while today is just a preview of the full length video, if you want to watch the full length or any of our exclusive content, then become a member of MIC. So the first thing that um, kind of veteran traders uh, will know is that nothing is 100%, meaning nothing works 100% of the time, but not only is not every idea 100%, not every trade is going to be 100% on the timing aspect. That's why I put it twice. And so traders deal in terms of probabilities, right? So a trader will never say something like, I'm going to short the death line because stocks always tank after the death line. If that's, if that's your mentality, I think there's a little something wrong there I, because what you're thinking about is what's going to happen after my entry, right? But you're not thinking about what you have to risk to get there, right? A, a, re, a, a, tr, a veteran trader will say something like, I'm shorting the death line because I know things. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. I'm shorting the death line because I know the probability of the stock reclaiming the death line is very low, right? See how the mentality is a little bit different? One is thinking about risk and one is thinking about the gain, right? Uh, so trading is putting your bets with the probabilities while taking risk reward into account and accepting that losses are a part of every strategy. And I'm going to emphasize that last line, right? Losses are a part of every single strategy. Death lines are not 100%. There are losses attributed to the death line setup, right? Low hanging fruits have, you know, a loss incorporated into them. You know, when low hanging fruits lose, where do you want to be losing, right? Your, your exit strategies, your stop strategies for, for your, um, your setups need to um, be taken into account when you're, uh, when you're uh, adding up the vast um, number of trades you take, right? Because as Joe kind of hinted on, it's not one trade that's going to make your trading career. It's going to be a thousand trades, right? A thousand trade, a thousand trades is what's going to determine the setup, not one trade, right? And you can't go changing your one trade because then you'll never know what, you know, if it's a good trade or not. So knowing that nothing is 100% is something that like a vet, you know, someone who can sustain the market for a few years will, will know. <coughs> Putting risk first, and this kind of goes into what I was just talking about. Um, wearing the risk management hat, right, versus the gain-seeking hat, is is the way a successful trader who's going to survive the tr you know the trading world, the stock market, twenty years has to be. You know, if you're always looking for the gain, and I have, I've seen traders blow up on Twitter. You know, they, I've seen Twitter Twitter traders come and go, and you just you know you just kind of be like, oh, whatever happened to that person? Like they're gone, and you can almost you can pretty much assume that they blew up because you know they posted flashy gains and that's also another indicator right if you see someone on twitter and they're always posting gains right that means they're very gain happy which means you know, you know you know what's coming next so recognizing the symptoms of the risk management hat versus the gain seeking hat some things that you'll notice when you're focusing on risk management is that you'll always determine the dollar amount of risk you want to lose before you enter the trade as opposed to um, you know, getting in and then thinking about where, where am I going to profit, right? When you get in, this is a good, this is a good question to ask yourself. When you get into the trade, what are you thinking about? For, what's the first thing you think of? What's the first thing that you think of? Where can it go? Or where's my stop? The first thing that, that should come in mind is the stop, that, the stop, right? Because that's how, that's how much you're going to know is the risk. And that's even going to know if you should even take the trade. Right? No one wants to short a stock at $5 if the risk has to be 7 So uh, planning your entries, exits, and ads, I think, are the most important part of recognizing if, whether you're entering into a trade where you're managing your risk or whether you're looking for a gain, right? It's where you, how you add, right? Because a, a lot of us will, will start into a, a stock short as it's going parabolic, and we, we, you know, you'll see the first red candle of the parabolic move be like, boom, at top, right? Boom, that's it. You, are look, you right now are looking for the gain. You're looking to get all your size at the top, and most of the time it's not gonna end well because um, you're, just, you're just looking for that ad, right? Um, 
As a, like that's that's what I call a candle-based entry. And you know, I I, I put candle-based entry. Like I could also put level two-based entry. This is when you see something, when you see the level two flash really fast, and you, you get that immediate FOMO. FOMO is a FOMO is literally a, a derivative of greed, right? You need all of your entries, exits, and ads should be planned. When you're when you're the difference is when you're watching a stock go parabolic and you're scaling in, you should already have maybe even said out loud, and I do this, say out loud prior, before the trade, if this thing rejects off eight hard, I'm going to add into that candle. Whereas instead of just seeing it re hard reject off eight, you'd be like, oh my, that's it, right? There's one, the big difference there, it could be the same entry, but one is planned and one is candle-based, level two-based, FOMO-based, right? Um, grading your setups, if you have a piece of paper written down and all of your setups have a different risk attached to them, like I've shown in my webinars, that, that right there shows that when, you enter the, when you're approaching the trading day, you have an idea of, I only want to lose X, right? I'm not, I want to make X, I want to lose X. It's, it's all about your priorities, right? Stop adjustments, and this could be trailing stop adjustments, this could be um, seeing, you know, having an original stop idea and then watching the stock's range get, dr you know, dramatically increase like past your expectations, you might want to then say, I need to adjust my risk, right? This, this is a symptom of wearing the risk management hat as opposed to, you know, when a stop for an ad isn't respected. Meaning, let's say you decide to add to a stock that just uh, put in a, a death candle, right, and you think it's good. That, that ad right there, is normally going to have an, a risk based off of the top of the death candle, right? This is something that cost freezes, right? And if you add, that's I, th I think that's totally valid. You're trying to get a full size setup on a trade. If you don't, you know, have that ad have a have a if you don't have a stop attached to that ad that respects the risk, you're not looking to manage risk, right? You're looking to make a gain. And traders are innately risk managers, not gain seekers, right? And one bad side about risk management is sometimes you end up being partial size for winners, right? Like, you, you know his foul today on his first bounce. He didn't go all in one shot at that opening first bounce because how, how, how you know, in the weeds would he, be, would he have been at 670, right? And so he was in 200 shares. It's a symptom. It's going to happen. But it's because he had risk in mind that, you know, that, was, um, that allowed him to, to make a, a win on that trade um, with a decent risk. And... The, the number one symptom is always going to be being oversized on your losers. That's just what's going to happen every single time if you put gain first instead of risk first. So, Bao also touched on this. It's being stern with your process, right? Deviating from your pro process is a very, 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 very slippery slope. Because what you're doing when you're trying to deviate from your process is you're trying to cheat your system. Right? And as I just said, every setup, every strategy has a loss attached to it. Now, if you try to cheat your system, right, there are times where you can probably deviate from your system and make money, but what you're doing, now you've entered the gambling game, right? Because like, you can maybe like add one last ad outside of your planned risk, and it might work, right? You think, oh, it's just like, and you're gonna get rewarded for it, right? You might get rewarded three times for it even, and this is even bad. But when you deviate from your process, um, eventually it's going to catch up. Eventually it's going to catch up, and it's not going to be ever worth it at all in the long run. Like if you if you deviate from your process a hundred times, you're, uh, you're gonna, your account's gone, right? So you're always going to have the question. <laughs> sorry, you're always going to have the question: Can you get away with this deviation? And you know, I would say a lot of the times the answer is going to be yes, you can. But how do you know it's not going to be the one time that erases? all the other wins from deviation, right? And even the wins that did not come from deviation, right? Can I do it just this once? Can I trade MTC or PSDV? It, you know, I don't normally short these stocks as 50% uh, institutional ownership, and it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's an under 1 million share float stock, but it looks really parabolic right here. I think I can get the top. I think this is it. And I, you, you might win, but like, What's going to happen when it's an LFIN or a BBTH, right? An MT MTC is an example of one of those, right? This, if you did break your rules, I mean, it's gone, right? MTC or PSTD, those ones are the ones that are going to wipe you out. So, like, you know, if, you're, if the question is ever just this once, the answer is no. 
right? Like, so don't, so always be aware that you're going to have a process and you're going to be seductive into breaking it because you think you can get away with it. And I'm just telling, it's not worth it, right? This is not the mindset of someone who sticks to their process, right? This is why Bao is super anal about his, his process because he knows, he knows the one time, it, it, it only takes one time, so why would you ever take a trade that only takes one time, right? Why would you ever break a process when it only takes one time to break the process to, bl to blow up, right? It's like, it's like some, I, I, I relate this analogy when I wash my knives the wrong way. I'm like, I, I, I never cut myself, but why would I ever do that, right? Why would I ever wash my knife the wrong way? I can get away with it. I can probably get away with it a lot of times, but why would I ever do that? Like, because it, it only takes once to cut myself. And then the second I cut myself, it's like, all the other times washing the knife the wrong way was kind of pointless because I cut myself eventually. So, um, the risk to reward of keeping your mental capital intact is the biggest ben is the biggest benefit of being stern with your process, right? Because the risk of what happens when you break the MTC rule, right, or the PSTV rule or the BPTH rule, the risk of that your mental capital is gone. You're just going to be kicking yourself in the dump. And how do you expect to trade tomorrow? when you're kicking yourself so hard today, right? The reward of keeping your mental, um, of men keeping your mental capital intact is being able to make the same amount of money that you would have on MTC tomorrow on a, a better stock, right? So you, everyone always thinks that you have to make your money back on the same stock if you lose. Everyone always thinks that you have to do the hot chick, right? Everyone always you know, has this fear and this, this fear of missing it, right? Coming into the day fresh is going to make thousands more dollars in the long run. It's just, you, you don't have to do it, right? You're, you're keeping your mental capital intact is going to always keep you fresh. And so basically, this is what I'm talking about is opportunity cost. You know, like the, the opportunity cost you're going to miss tomorrow because you messed up MTC today is going to be more than you would have made on MTC today. Because, you know, if you did decide to break your process on MTC or PSTV, you're not doing it with, like, a 5,000 share order. Right? You're just trying to be cool, you're trying to be quick, you're trying to short, trying to get that super top, right? And, like, you, you know, like, you know that you're going to go smaller in it, but, like, it's so easy to get trapped. The, the risk of that happening and just, you know, feeling lousy about it the next day, you know, when you could make more the next day on one of your A-plus sets. All right, so the topics today are going to be stop loss types and mental versus hard stops, and another one, a daily profit stop. And then we're going to do some basic chart analysis here. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Joe Kelly. Three and a half years trading uh, momentum small caps and OTCs, and I do a lot of data analysis and risk management. That is like my strong points. So. This is a quote that I heard a long time ago, and it holds very, very true to trading as well. And this was actually, this quote was, was uh, I heard it when I raced motocross, and, uh, but opportunities, and it relates to the market too, opportunities in the market are like a bus. Every bus keeps coming along, right? There's always another bus right around the corner. But if you don't manage your risk properly, you're going to be stuck under the last bus and you're going to get ran over and you're not going to be able to trade the next opportunity. So that's why it's always important to survive and be able to trade the next day. So we're going to go quickly through types of stop losses just so we don't get too uh, in depth with it. Maybe. So the first one is going to be like a is going to be a price based stop. So it's very simple: high a day, low a day, higher high, lower low. You're basically just analyzing a chart, looking at price levels, deciding where the best stop loss is. If you always find yourself stopping out when you place the stop loss, guess what? You're part of the herd. That's why you keep getting stopped out. Is because you pick the most obvious place. That is a stop loss on BLIN on Thursday, and I think I've told this story like four times. I saw a member post that he just stopped out at like the 260 level after it like went all the way three, and then went, mm -hmm. and then here's three or 260, like stopped out. I took a screenshot of it, and I was like top indicator because it just stopped out at resistance, right? It just stopped out at the most obvious level. 
where somebody would want to put a stop loss. So when you're placing a stop, you have to ask yourself two questions. Is the risk managed and is it an obvious stop loss? If it's a short bias trade and you're placing an obvious stop, sometimes you don't have an option. Like your only option is it's high a day, right? Somebody will use pre-market high, somebody use high a day, whatever it is, it's an obvious level. But when it breaks, you have to watch and make sure that it doesn't just go whoop and then crash again. Because like Yuma today, Yuma had a high day at 390, breaks the high day, goes to 395, and then you're right back under. Nobody trapped. That trap longs more than anything. Because it was barely a breakout. <coughs> breaks, fails, and then it grinds, and it tries to recover. <coughs> now, we had time-based stops. So this is a different level of risk management to where you're giving your trade a certain amount of time to work or a certain time of day that once this time of day happens, this setup no longer is valid. This setup usually doesn't happen after, like first bounce, for example. If the first bounce doesn't happen within like the first 15 minutes or 30 minutes of the trading day, you're not gonna go into the late day looking for a first bounce. That's gonna be like the 40th bounce. You don't go into 2 p.m. looking for something to parabolic and pull back and then go again. Know the optimal times of day to place a stop loss and to use a time stop. Now the second part to that, these are some of those basic time frames would be 10.30, which is the zombie time which everybody likes to either stop out if you're short, but if you're long biased, you probably start to look to accumulate dips and look for a move higher. 2 p.m. or 3.30 p.m., those are general fade times or reclaim of trends to move to higher highs. The next part, this is the number of bars or the amount of time that you're in the trade since you've got the entry. So this would be what you call edge decay. So edge decay is you take a trade and in 30 minutes, it still is not going your way, but it still hasn't hit your stop, but it still hasn't hit your target. Is the trade still valid? Or is it caught in consolidation now? You, you bought for a first bounce and it didn't immediately happen. After five minutes, it's not a first bounce anymore, it's just consolidation. So you have to know how long it usually takes in order for this trade to work so you don't get caught we were talking about buying higher lows. Somebody will look at a chart and they'll go, I see making higher lows. And then they buy. And then it just kind of goes back. And then maybe a little bit more. And then it does nothing. But they're like, well, my stop has never been hit. So I got to stay in the trade. But my target hasn't been hit either. So I got to stay in the trade. But do you really need to stay in the trade? Or do you really need to just consider it a failed trade? Take it off for break even, maybe lose two cents, maybe lose five cents, whatever it may be. You stop out when the chart tells you, hey, no, it's, pretty, it's really just kind of doing this. It's not working. So now we're gonna talk about order types to use for risk management. The first is just being a stop order. That can either be a market stop, which is gonna basically be if I short here, buy here, it hits this level, I market order out of the position. Everybody goes, oh my God, don't use the market. Use a stop limit one time and tell me if you don't want to use a stop market. Because it's going to go hit and trigger your stop and then it's going to blow right past your limit and you're like, should have used the market. Trailing. This one is actually really good to ride trends. For example, if you're a long bias trader and you want to stay in a certain position, let's say like Yuma today, if we use a 30 cent or a 50 cent trailer after we enter the position, as it continues to bounce and ride up and ride up and ride up and ride up, we only stop out if it drops from the highest price 50 cents or more. That's when we finally stop out. In small caps, using a trailing stop is really risky because of the volatility. So I would never recommend anybody uses a trailing stop until later in the day. Don't use a trailer in the morning because you're just gonna get whipsawed out of it and you're gonna bottom ticket. You'd be like and it's just gonna But later in the day once it joins trend, 
that's when it becomes more smooth. Like, after an hour of the day, you pretty much just watch paint dry, right? That's just a stock that's trending, or channeling, whatever it may be. Trailing stop would work good in that period of time. A range stop, or a range order, consists of two things. A stop loss and a profit target, all in one. Now, what I do with range orders is I don't bulk my entire range order into one. So, if I have 500 shares, but I want to scale out of that position, I can use range orders to do that. I'm just going to submit five range orders for 100 shares, or two, for 250, or three, for some strange number. But I can scale out of that position as it goes along. Now, one dangerous thing to pay attention to, and always be aware of, and this is why you don't walk away if you even have a range order in, or stop loss for that matter, if there's a partial fill on one side of the range order, either your target or your stop, it won't execute the rest of it. Okay? So you have 100 shares, it fills 67, the rest stays. Unless it goes in the direction against you fully, right? So the stop is at 5, it goes to 5, you execute 67 shares, and then it drops you still have 23 shares. You don't have, it didn't stop you all out. Or, the worst part, it hits your target, right? It comes down or up to you, and you take 67 shares off, and you're still stuck, the rest. And you're like, oh, well, it's okay, I've still got to stop out there. No, you don't. That order is canceled. It's virtually un, it's partially filled and not able to fill the rest of it. That is a very dangerous part to that. So OCO orders can actually help you get outside of the limitations of a range order. The big difference is, one, you have trigger orders that are very similar to OCO orders. So trigger order means that one order is live in the market. It was short at $5. That order, once executed, triggers another order. Okay? The other order is sitting and waiting. It's not out in the market yet. It will be once five is executed. OCO orders are two orders, both live in the market at the same time. Whatever one executes, cancels the other. Same risk is involved though. If one partially fills, the other order is canceled. All right, testing. So welcome back guys. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a bunch of questions, okay? Uh, we trade in the morning, it didn't work out. It worked out, doesn't matter what the result is. Um, you have your plan, the best time to trade a certain thing. So I wanted to talk about certain setups. So there's a high day right here, you see this? If it breaks that level, it's off to the races, and sure enough. So there's two things, two areas to look for. VWAP reclaim. I think the VWAP was what, dude? I, it was 380, I don't know, 370. So we VWAP reclaim and high day, which is the 470 break. Okay, does that, 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 that trade make sense to you? So those are the things you're looking for in the long. And it's never fucking reclaim VWAP. It's fucking dead. Uh, it also has a big at the, uh, at the market dilution going on about uh, ATM, we call it. And dude, FTC never freaking made it, man. That was a little bit off. Like, not much, man. 10 cents or so, 5 cents. So that covers that. So I wanted to take questions from whoever wants to take questions, and then you guys can come up, and then we can do a workshop on answering some of the questions. So think of a good question you guys want to answer, and then we can use this opportunity to answer them. Don't be shy. <laughs> anybody, anybody wants to ask a question? Or you can look at the trade or do whatever you guys like. This is all up to you guys. All right, yeah, come up, man. Yeah, what, what's your question for us? Let's see if it's warts coming up. <laughs> uh, so this is something I was wondering uh, about, about your process in the morning. So you had a lot of, you had a very strict plan. So all right, come up. Let me a good question across. I like that. <laughs> nothing specific. Nothing like, oh, what happens if you the thing drops? I mean, then you fucking sell. <laughs> all right, ask your question. Hi, everybody. Um, so my question was for. Bao, um, about his process and 
going over what he did this morning, um, setting out his lines and his parameters, you know, you have some plays that you look at it and you say, okay, this could be very high probability, this one not so much, but I'm gonna throw this order out because that could be a great opportunity. Um, the ones that you give a lot of attention to, like today we gave a lot of attention, a lot of screen time to uh, first bounce plays. Um, on those second day plays, if you know you're not gonna give those a lot of screen time, do you ever set um, bracket orders so that it's a little bit more automated? Whenever the you, you, you're in that first bounce play, you're in that day one, that hot shake, and you have your, your low hangers a little bit more automated. Is that ever a situation for you? That is a great question. That's something I, I should do. I don't because I'm an old dinosaur that never even knew what a stop was for many years. And so I had a bunch of bad habits. That's why, like I said, man, you guys are very fortunate that you, you are starting young and you're asking this type of question. So, of course, you see my fancy orders? I throw them out there. My fancy orders are all manual. If you guys have automated using OC orders and trigger orders, freaking do it. Instead of doing my, my way, which is the dinosaur way, you can do that. Set it up, it doesn't hit, it doesn't hit. So do it, dude, throw them all out. Uh, an or it could be, an OC or it could be, if it breaks the VWAP, reclaim by it. With a 15 cent stop loss, for example, right? Or if it breaks high day, 15 cent stop loss. So those are the OC orders, exactly what you're doing, so. So keep doing it, man, just throw them all out. And that's the risk reward. I, the bad habit I got is mental stops, which Joe talked about, those are bad. But I mitigate it because I, I, I hammer it hard the first hour and I walk away because I'm mostly a short-sighted trader. And so these setups, I, I, this is a case where it worked. I waited two hours, it would work, but most of the time it doesn't do this. This is, but this happens all the time. Once you catch something like this, you make money. The, the key is the patience and the OC orders alleviate having to sit around and keep waiting for all this. So yes, your way of doing it is perfectly right. Cool, thanks, thanks Oscar. Well, out here in the room, so anybody wants to ask him a question? Anybody? Is there a certain price action that, if you observe it, you'll just stay away from a stock long or short? Do we have two microphones? Yeah, we have that one microphone that's right in front of you. I think that's right here. Oh, is it? No, that's, that's for the video. Oh. So it works. Both of these are tied in? No. no, no. no. And that's just for that. Oh, so this needs to be staying here. Because so, I want whoever wants to ask a question to come up and, I guess, come on now, then. I'm going to move my food over here. So <laughs> when you're recording, it doesn't look all nasty. All right, man. Thank you. Just uh, in general, is there a certain price action that you see that you'll say, I'm staying now away from this stock, whether it's long or short? Just kind of scary, so to speak. See, the, 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 you have the fear once again. That for me, I have no fear. If it goes to my lines, these large lines, that's the setup. You see what I'm saying? So you're like, dude, you're so fearful because you're like, what if this happens? What if that happens? But if you can mitigate the risk using the hard stops or know exactly where you get in and get out, you see what I'm saying? Just throw it out there. Just throw it out there. So I don't really care. I call, I call it like... I, remember, I, I always talk about line to line, right? And anything in between the line to me is noise. And so that to me is those are the untradeable areas. But a good line is the VWAP reclaim. High of day, that's another line, right? So those, those, those are two lines. And the rest, if, for me, it's not scary. It's more of, I don't know what's going on. I'm not gonna trade things in which I don't know what's going on. It's indeterminate. It's ambiguous. It could go either up or down, I cannot tell. There's certain lines that if it gets breached or broken, it goes way up or way down. So that makes sense, guys? So now what's gonna happen is the next line is the, the high day, which is, what is this, guys? This is, uh, yeah, what's the high day on this? 645. 645? 45. 45, there we go. And so now if you see this, this could be the new support around the 550, and that's all you do. It gets to a point where it's just so high, guys, where you have to, like, how much more can you make on the beat, right? How much more the downside? So you can trade, remember, you can trade anything you want. I don't care if you buying stuff, which is against the rules, as long as you have the stocks in place. If you, I keep saying, if you predefine your risk, there's nothing to be scared of. You know, my risk is 100 bucks, so you use reverse engineering math to come up with, with your price, your exit, and that's what it is, right? Hundred hundred bucks. If I want to lose only a hundred dollars on this play, 
I could do 1,000 shares with 10 cent stop, right? Or I could do 500 shares with 20 cent stop. You see what I'm saying? Or 100 shares with a, a dollar stop or whatever. <laughs> that adds up to um, 100. You see you have to use reverse math and you preach fine your wrist and you never get scared. Right, anybody any questions? Line up and just come up and ask a question, man. Yeah, I did. Alright, cool. <laughs> Alright. I'll be the MC. <laughs> okay, hello. Hey, Woody. Hey, how are you doing? Um, what I'm trying to think about is, like, you call bullets, obviously, is, you know, I don't want to know the exact dollar or shares, because that might drive you crazy, but if you could put it, like, in the fractions, so you talked. You were telling me the other day, like you had them in four bullets. So, like you know, your first bullet is maybe one eighth, and then the next one is half. Or how's your general strategy when you're looking at them in the morning? So again, don't tell me the shares because that'll right. mess with me. Right. But just right. something like that. Everybody's skills different, right? Point, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you how I do it. I'll tell Alex, and then. Uh, Austin is going to tell you how you do it, right? For for me, what what I don't I don't I scale in terms of the lines. I give myself two, three max in terms of lines, and then if I go three lines, I reduce my size. So the rule of thumb is different for each stock. If the lines are so close, then I can you know I, I'm okay to, to go three lines. But if the next line is so far away, hold on, I'm going to stop at that big break, right? You see what I'm saying? So it's not don't. Don't be so robotic to think every stock used to do one eighth, one fourth. No, it depends on the strength, the time of day, and what your objective is. If your objective is to scalp 20 cents, or is it hold for the for the trend break, or it's all that. But the key is for me, everyone has a different type of scaling. My scaling is line and line. Or every or like let's say I want the three dollar, I would do two ninety seven and then three oh seven to average down three bucks. And I, for me personally, I like to use only 50% max. He, Alex has a 30% rule on the front side. I do like 50% max on the front side. So like, for example, like my, I could have gone 10,000 shares deep and they may have got me out of the position. But I stopped at 4,000 shares and 4,000 shares got dropped enough 50 cents. I'm stupid, I lost two grand on it. So it all depends on what it is, right? So I'm nowhere near my max loss for the day. I'm nowhere near my max size for the day. So it's, it's kind of like a feeling. And to be honest, I didn't really want to take that trade. <laughs> I just did for education-wise, but at the end of the day, like you, you saw how I did when I, when I started scaling in. I started very small size. And even that small size made me 2,000 bucks. Hey traders, this is Tosh. I go by T Bradley 90 in the My Investing Club chat. Just wanted to reach out and say if you have any questions about MIC, joining MIC, maybe you're a member already, you have three ways to contact myself personally and through MIC. You can hit our social media, you can hit me through PMs in chat, or you can contact us through my email at Tosh at myinvestingclub.com. That's T O S H at myinvestingclub.com. I will get back to you in a timely manner, and I'm saying this because I'm here to help, and I don't want anybody to be afraid to reach out and ask any question that they have. We are here for you guys. All right, see you guys.